Between the years of 1977 and 1982, writer Stephen King wrote and published four short stories under the pseudonym Richard Bachman, which were then republished in 1985 in one volume called The Bachman Books, was The Running Man. Now the story revolved around the character called Ben Richards, a down on his luck family man who decides to participate on the nation's favourite game show The Running Man, which is run by the Games Network, which in turn is run by the government. The object is to survive for 30 days, travelling around the world and avoiding not only the hunters, an elite force sent after him, but the general public who can kill him and get a bounty that's been placed on his head. If he survives, he gets a big cash payment to help his family and help save his terminally ill daughter, in addition to cash he can win by either surviving by the hour or by killing either law enforcement or the hunters. However, when he is informed that his family has actually been murdered before he even appears on the show, he eventually takes matters into his own hands. Now originally, when the film itself was being written, it was due to star Christopher Reeve, and the plot was to stay close to the actual book. But when the original director, Paul Michael Glazier, couldn't direct due to the pre-production schedule being insufficient, director Andrew Davis was brought in instead. However, he was fired no more than two weeks later, and Glazer was actually brought back on board. And by this time, Arnold Schwarzenegger was cast in the main role of Richards instead of Reeve, and the story had changed dramatically, from a desperate family man doing what he had to, to that of one framed for mass murder by the army. It also changed from a dark movie to one filled with humour and one-liners, and it was more in line with its in-fashion-at-the-time main star. Now, as I mentioned, the film's plot sees Richards, now in the army as a helicopter pilot whose squad is deployed over Bakersfield to quell a food riot. Refusing to fire on unarmed people, he is knocked unconscious and framed for the massacre, being labelled as the Butcher of Bakersfield. Breaking out of a high security prison with the help of two inmates, played by Yavit Koto and Marvin J. McIntyre, Richards goes underground, and with the help of the resistance leader, played by Mick Fleetwood in a guest role, Richards goes back to the city and finds out from one Amber Mendez, played by Maria Conchita Alonso, that his brother was taken away for re-education. However, she turns Richards in at the airport when he tries to kidnap her to go to Hawaii. Before this even happens, he actually comes to the attention of one Damon Killian, played by famed game show host Richard Dawson, who sees him as the perfect contestant for the game show The Running Man and blackmails the now-captured Richards into participating, saying, if you don't volunteer, Weiss and Laughlin will go on in your place. And now Richards is playing for the ultimate prize, his life. The film also starred Professor Toru Tanaka, from movies such as Chuck Norris's An Eye for an Eye, and The Perfect Weapon starring Jeff Speakman. Here, he plays Sub-Zero the first stalker they face off against in the first arena, which is nothing but a massive hockey rink. And also appearing is Jim Brown from the war classic The Dirty Dozen as Fireball, who has a jetpack strapped to his back while carrying a flamethrower, and also stars Jesse Ventura as retired stalker turned guest host and workout instructor, Captain Freedom. Now I first discovered the film back in the very early 90s, and its humour, action, comic book style violence, and one-liners made the film an instant hit with me, and even now, watching it back, it is very 80s and very cheesy, and that's probably why I like it so much. It's action-packed, it's very funny, and you get the feeling it just doesn't take itself seriously whatsoever. Now obviously, I'm not the only one who thought this. One Eugene Jarvis, who co-created the 1982 arcade hit Robotron, and Mark Turmel, obviously thought so too and thus taking inspiration from The Running Man, Smash TV was born. Putting you, and a friend if you have one, as a contestant, you have to fight your way through arenas packed with thugs, mutants, men in tanks, men who explode called Mr. Shrapnel, huge snakes and floaty balls of death. You also have to contend with turrets and mines, the latter of which can lead to a premature and squelchy death with eyeballs and feet filled shoes heading towards the screen. Each arena has multiple rooms, 
with four exits you can choose from as you complete them, meaning many possible ways of getting to the boss room. And along the way, you can pick up presents or prizes, such as a sleek 1990s roadster, a toaster, plus cash and even gold and silver bars. You even get the chance to pick up keys to enable you to enter the Pleasure Dome at the very end. Now that being said, the initial version of the arcade game never actually had the said Pleasure Dome in it, as it was thought that no one would ever complete the game as it was deemed too difficult. However, after many angry complaints from people who actually did manage to complete the game and found no Pleasure Dome to speak of, Williams Electronic Entertainment actually released an updated board which would include said Pleasure Dome. Now at the beginning of the game, your player would leave the contestants row and the baying audience and enter the arena. And at the beginning of the arena, you'd get the host pop up with his arms around two busty beauties while quoting either the I'd buy that for a dollar catchphrase from Robocop or BIG MONEY! BIG PRIZES! I LOVE IT! or while being a lecherous old git and having a nuke. You get two joysticks with which to control your character. The left moves the character, while the right lets you fire in all eight directions, which is the same control system used in Robotron 2084 eight years previous. Now a game run on the Midway Y unit, which was also used for the game's spiritual sequel Total Carnage, as well as Super High Impact, Terminator 2 Arcade, Strike Force, and 1992's Mortal Kombat, with the sound being handled by an M6809 chip at 2 MHz, a WM2151 at near enough 3.8 MHz, a HC55516 chip, and two DAC chips. Not that I know what any of that means, all I know is that he looks and sounds bloody fantastic. And of course, a game as well received as Smash TV was always going to get a home conversion, or in this case, a good 10 with Ocean publishing the home computer versions while a claim sorted out the consoles, near enough all of which were handled by Probe Software. How much in keeping with the arcade versions were the home conversions? Starting off with the first of the 16-bit systems, the Amiga version is pretty faithful to its arcade parent, though there are a few things that do differ. For instance, there is no seeing your little guy making his way to the next room. Instead, the screen faces the Smash TV logo to load the next room before fading back. Plus, there are no gantries overhead as well, the crowd aren't even animated, and the only music that plays is when the game is being loaded into the Amiga's extra memory. But, on the plus side, it looks quite faithful. It has speech, and it gives you the option of having one or two players with either one or two joysticks each, preserving the arcade experience. But playing with just the one joystick is a lot of hard work, as you can only fire in the direction you're moving, which makes the game much more difficult than it should be. Still, on the whole, it's a good conversion, which, those differences and difficulty aside, is still pretty good fun. Next up is the Atari ST version, and there's a few more differences here, with music added, but the title screen looking a bit less defined, and looking a little scaled back, both in colour and detail, in contrast to the Amiga port. This also applies to the in-game graphics too. The sound effects are also scaled back because of the ST sound chip, and there's no cheering crowd or speech. But it plays like the Amiga version, with the same speed as well, and it's just as difficult with the one joystick. Though, like its Amiga cousin, also gives you the option of having two sticks per player. Now the Mega Drive Genesis version does make good use of the sound chip, with a pretty good rendition of the theme music being used to play over the title screen. One change between the Amiga and Mega Drive versions are the design of the high score and credit tables. On the Amiga, it's just a generic design. But here, they actually have pulsing lights going around them. All three of the A, B, C buttons are put to good use, with A being standard fire, B reverse fire, and C locks your firing orientation, which means you can actually strafe while firing. It can make it a little bit more hectic, but it doesn't make it any less fun. 
It's still difficult, but it's still a good conversion. Now the SNES version benefits from having four main action buttons on the controller, A, B, Y and X, which means you can actually fire in all four directions while moving again in all four directions. So you can move backwards while firing in one direction, which makes it a lot more easier. That being said, the character moves a lot slower and it actually makes it a bit more harder than it should be. The upside though, is that the sound does benefit from the SNES's sound chip which makes it sound great and it, almost, and it also looks as good as its Mega Drive brother. If you ever wanted a version that's more orange than orange or more brown than something that's brown then the NES version will suit you down to the ground. It wasn't actually programmed by Probe, but by Bits instead, and it retains the controller options of its home computer cousins, meaning you can actually use two controllers for one person, and if you have a multi-tap, or whatever the multi-tap was called back then, you could use two controllers per player, which is a nice touch. It actually had speech, which I must admit is actually pretty damn good and is much better than the speech in the pinball game High Speed that was released on the system. It had music, but it only plays for a little while after you enter a room. The player character walking to the different rooms but through funny looking corridors, and even the host popping up. It also retains the difficulty when you use just the one pad. It's just that the levels just look very orange and brown with a touch of red thrown in and a little bit of green on the side. Now with the Master System and Game Gear versions they sound exactly the same. I must admit both do sound pretty good. One of the downsides though is that the music starts to grate very badly as it just repeats and repeats, and repeats, ad infinitum, and it's also just a tad too fast. It just doesn't sound right whatsoever. And also, where the Master System allows for two players, the Game Gear only allows for one. I don't think there's any option for Game Gear to Game Gear hookup. I don't even think that was actually a possibility. However, where this differs greatly from its 16-bit cousins is that you actually get six continues per game, as opposed to the Mega Drops 1 and the Amigas 3. Plus, there are less enemies on screen at once, though there are more waves. And this just makes it a little bit more boring than the other versions. So instead of actually being able to kill a few of them then go to the next room, you're continuously killing, continuous, continuous, continuous until you get so bored you just want to switch it off. The other thing is that your player and the enemy grunts move a bit on the fast side. That's the Master System version. The Game Gear version counters this and it's a bit more slower, which does make it a little bit more easier to play. And if you want to change what the buttons do in the options menu, you can do so. So you can have the standard fire on one button and locked orientation on the other or however you want. But I still wouldn't recommend these versions, mainly because they just feel boring with the countless waves per room, and in the Master Systems case, being just a tad too fast. And now we move on to the first of the 8-bit micro-releases. Starting off with the Commodore 64 version, it doesn't sound or look that bad. It has a nice speed to it, it has music on the title screen and control option screen, though with none in-game, and you even hear the enemy grunts say OW when you shoot them, in a Commodore 64 way. <laughs> However, there is no blood, but rather, like the NES version and the Super Nintendo version, they just explode. 
The control system allows you to use the keyboard or joystick and from the looks of it, no option for using two sticks or eight buttons on the keyboard. It's still a tough game even though there aren't as many enemies on screen, but they just keep coming. Still, it's quite competent and it was pretty good fun. And with the Amstrad version, it has a different title screen to its brothers and it looks more akin to an apocalyptic movie cover. The controls are exactly the same as the Commodore 64, but in-game there's less enemies and just spot effects for firing your weapons, explosions, pickups and when you get electrocuted. And there's no music either. The grunts have a set pattern and just move from the bottom of the screen up in a zigzag movement making it much easier than the other versions. When you die you don't go through the doors but instead just respawn where you died and even the status bars are much simpler too. Plus it's a one player only game so it looks like you're on your own. Now the last of the 8-bit micro versions. The Spectrum has the same loading screen as the Amstrad but after loading it has the music from the arcade version and I must admit it is actually pretty damn good to boot. Now control wise you get more options with the choice of either the Kempston or Sinclair joysticks, keyboard or the chance to redefine your own keyboard controls. No dual joysticks for you my spec chum, oh no no no. Graphically it looks the same as the Amstrad but with its own specky spin on them. The status bar is just as minimal the enemy movements patterns are the same, and even the sound is just pop pop for both firing and explosions with a kind of screech for picking up prizes. One bonus it does have is that it looks like it even has a little bit of blood when you dispatch the enemies. Which is nice. Still, for the at the time aging specky, it's not a bad port. There is some fun to be had, and even with the set enemy patterns and less enemies on screen, it's still a little bit of a challenge. Right, that's it. I'm off to see if I can win myself a sleek 1990s roaster or a brand new toaster. I'll see you in the next video. So until then, goodbye for now. And... Good luck! You'll need it! <laughs>